welcome to Relevant History. I'm Dan Toller. Today is a special day in the show because we've turned a corner. So far, with the exception of a few episodes about Ethiopia and one on the Delhi Sultanate, we've been focusing on Europe and the Mediterranean. And that's because the theme of this season is nationalism, and modern nationalism first took root in Europe, uh, starting with the Peace of Westphalia in 1648. But this idea of nationalism doesn't begin to take shape in a vacuum. It takes shape during the so-called Age of Exploration, when Europeans are colonizing much of the rest of the world. And as Europeans do this, they encounter all kinds of people with all kinds of ideas about what it means to be a nation. And a lot of times this impacts how they are able to colonize. What do I mean by that? Well, Take a look at the British Raj in India. The commercial military mechanism by which Great Britain kept India subjugated for well over a century. Well, at the time that the British begin to establish colonial rights in India, India is not a united nation. There are several different countries and kingdoms and sultanates throughout the Indian subcontinent when the British show up. Uh, So the British are able to play one against the other and gain an advantage and eventually uh, dominate the area. Now, the British started colonizing India in earnest in the 1750s. Imagine what would have happened if they had showed up and all of the Indian subcontinent was united under one ruler who did not want to be colonized. Well, the idea that Great Britain would be able to fight the entire Indian subcontinent and subjugate them, I mean, that's just ridiculous. It's not going to happen. And sure enough, uh, when the Indian people do develop a sort of unified national spirit, well, they are able to extricate themselves from British rule, aren't they? Now, let's contrast this with a part of the world that never got colonized. Take Japan. In the Edo period, which is roughly the period during which the Europeans were doing a lot of colonizing, uh, Japan is mostly ruled by local daimyos, or lords, uh, roughly speaking, uh, under the loose leadership of the shogun, who is not always a very powerful figure, shall we say, but the important thing that Japan has is a sense of unity. See, under the shogunate, uh, while the daimyos might be fighting each other from time to time, an attack by an outside power on one member of the shogunate is an attack on all. It's an attack on all of Japan. So colonizing powers are not able to play one daimyo against the other Uh, the way that they are able to do with the leaders in India. And lo and behold, no part of Japan is ever colonized by an outside power. But having a national spirit, or identity, shall we say, that is not the only necessary ingredient you need to stay out of colonization. There are some nations that never really have a fighting chance. What I'm talking about are the Native American peoples who lived in North and South America. Now, you might be thinking that I'm talking about differences in technology here. The Europeans show up with their guns and their horses, and these poor Native peoples, they just don't stand a chance. Well... 
there is a difference in technology, but that's only a part of the puzzle. See, early European expeditions to the Americas were incredibly expensive. And there were typically only a few hundred guys. For example, uh, the early Spanish military actions against the Aztecs. They only succeeded because the Aztecs were tyrannical rulers who terrorized all the surrounding tribes and harvested their people for human sacrifices. And oftentimes when you hear modern-day accounts of the Spanish defeat of the Aztecs at the Battle of Tenochtitlan in uh, modern-day Mexico City, you hear about this small band of conquistadors uh, sticking it out and eventually winning against huge odds. Well, the real credit should go to the tens of thousands of people from the various Aztec subject tribes who just happen to rise up in rebellion against the Aztecs when these Europeans show up. The presence of a few hundred Spanish soldiers and their muskets, this is just the spark that the local people needed to launch a revolt. But it probably would have happened anyway. My point being, those few hundred Spanish soldiers by themselves would not have been able to overthrow the Aztec Empire. Had they tried something like that on their own, we would probably be sitting around today talking about what a dumb idea it was. And understand something. In the year 1492, the population of the Americas is around 60 million. Now, that's a controversial number. It's highly disputed, maybe as low as uh, 20 to 40 million, maybe as high as 100 million. But when you look at multiple estimates from anthropologists and people who are way more qualified than I am, the average of what people estimate is around 60 million folks in the Americas. And of those 60 million or so at the time, again, there are somewhere around 20 million uh, in modern-day Mexico, which is the Aztec sphere of influence. Now, to put that in perspective, the population of Spain in 1492 is only 9.8 million. So, even with their technology, I doubt Spain could ever have conquered all of South and Central America much less anything else, they probably wouldn't have even stood a chance against the Aztecs. Especially not with the relatively small number of soldiers they could afford to send. So, let's ask again, how do they succeed? And if it's not technology, what is it? The main driver of Spanish success in the coming years and the doom of the local peoples is something called the Columbian Exchange. Now, that is a nice, soft term for a really nasty event. See, this is when the indigenous American peoples are first exposed to a bunch of old-world diseases. And this is a problem unique to the Americas. And it, it's not a problem for indigenous peoples anywhere in the old world. Right? Even during the so-called scramble for Africa, when Europeans are racing to see who can colonize most of the continent, African peoples won't have to contend with a bunch of new diseases. Right? They are already plugged into that old world biome. They've been exposed to things like smallpox and the bubonic plague and the measles. The New World peoples, on the other hand, have no exposure to any of these diseases. They have no kind of immunity, nothing to protect them. Not only that, but they're not just getting one pandemic at a time. They seem to be getting them all at once. Think of what one comparatively minor disease has done to our own society. It's smallpox, the bubonic plague, those are big killers. When you get hit by 
multiple diseases at once, it's going to have a devastating effect on your society. In a sense, the second that the first European ship lands on American shores, many of the native peoples are doomed. It doesn't matter if the Europeans are the nicest visitors ever and they're not doing things like enslaving the locals or stealing their gold. Even in that highly fictional scenario, those natives are about to go through an experience that can only be described as apocalyptic. A few months ago, we did an episode called Behold a Pale Horse about the Black Plague in medieval Europe and the Middle East. And during that time, over the course of about a decade, between a third and a half of the population dies. But there are some Native American peoples who would absolutely love to have seen those kinds of numbers. Because during the Columbian Exchange, between 80 and 95 percent of people succumb to the disease. And the real number is probably somewhere closer to the high end. But even if we take the low end number, right, 80%, that's four out of five people in the new world just gone. What if it's 90% or that high number, 95%? 19 out of 20 people. What does that do to a civilization? Imagine an alien invasion movie. And the aliens aren't any bigger than us or stronger than us. Sure, they've got some crazy advanced light speed technology, but there are only a few of them. It's not that scary of a movie, is it? But now, imagine that as soon as the aliens arrive... This plague goes around and wipes out 90% of the Earth's population, and the survivors somehow have to come together and deal with these aliens. Suddenly, the story gets pretty scary. But it would be unfair to paint the Native American peoples as one unified block, and it would also be unfair to treat the European colonizers as one unified block. And if you were one of those native peoples, your experience under colonization would be different depending on who shows up. Take the people who are unfortunate enough to be colonized by the Spanish and the Portuguese, the peoples of Central and South America and the Caribbean. These people get the absolute worst of it because within a few generations, they are either slaves or they are on the bottom rung of a racial caste system. Now, we can blame part of this on the Spanish attitude towards the colonized peoples. These people aren't Christians, and that therefore it's okay to enslave them. But let's also not discount simple human greed here. Parts of South America are rich with gold. And if that gold is going to be extracted, people are going to have to work in the mines. Even today, mine work is no picnic. So you can imagine how bad it was back then. And from the dawn of time to the Industrial Revolution, in fact, most miners in most places have been slaves. And the same is true, as it turns out, for the plantations in the Caribbean and South America. Agricultural work, growing tobacco and coffee and sugar. This is backbreaking labor, and slaves are way cheaper than what you'd have to pay a free laborer to do the same work. Okay. So much for the folks who were unlucky enough to be colonized by the Spanish. What about those in North America? Well, as most of you probably know, it would not go well for most of them either. But 
their experience would be different from the peoples of South America. And the process would be more complicated. And I would argue that that's for a couple of reasons. First, these areas are colonized by different people. Instead of the Spanish and Portuguese, you have the British, French, and for a little while, the Dutch. But that alone doesn't explain things. Because none of those powers actually, at the time, were morally opposed to slavery. We see the British quite happily enslaving natives on their Caribbean islands. We see them importing African slaves into Virginia. The French have all kinds of slavery going on in Haiti. Why aren't they enslaving natives in northeastern North America? What's going on here? Well, let's go back to the economic side of things. In northeastern North America, you don't have a lot of natural resources as far as mining goes, at least not yet. Obviously, later on, there will be coal discoveries and various other discoveries. But at this time, as far as any Europeans know, there are no rich natural resources here. Northeastern North America is good for timber, which you can get much cheaper from back home in Europe. No need to go way overseas for that. But The one thing that it's really good for is fur. And fur cannot be gotten by slave labor. You can't enslave people and then give them weapons and send them out into the wilderness hunting and expect them to just bring back all of their uh, profits to you. They're not going to remain slaves for very long. If you want fur, you have to trade for it. And so instead of coming into northeastern North America as conquerors, the first Europeans in this part of the world are coming in as trading partners. Now, there are many North American tribes, and each of them has their own story. Today, I'm going to talk about the Iroquois Confederacy, which is properly called the Haudenosaunee Confederacy. And that is the term I will be using. I'll explain why in a minute. These people are close to my heart, not least of all because I currently live near the geographic center of what used to be their land. The Haudenosaunee Confederacy consists of five tribes. They occupy parts of Ontario, Canada, and most of modern New York State, west of the Hudson Valley. As we'll see, these are their cultural heartlands, but at their height, the Haudenosaunee will control much of the south and eastern Great Lakes region, with territory as far south as Virginia. But for the most part, think of western and central New York State and a little bit of Ontario, Canada, as their cultural heartland. From west to east, the five tribes are the Seneca, the Cayuga, the Onondaga, the Oneida, and the Mohawk. Now, what I had originally wanted to do with this episode was a history of the Haudenosaunee people before European colonization. But unfortunately, that is all oral history, and as I did my research... I was running into all kinds of different stories. Each tribe has its own version, and sometimes there are different versions of the story within the same tribe, and all the versions are different. So what was going to be a straightforward story turned into me reading a bunch of tribal myths and coming out even more confused than I was beforehand. Here's what we can say for sure about the Haudenosaunee people. To begin with, the Iroquois are a linguistic group. This is a group that encompasses more than just the Haudenosaunee. 
Uh, for example, the Ticonderoga tribe are an Iroquoian tribe who live way down in the Carolinas, and then they migrate up to New York in the early 1700s to join the Haudenosaunee and become a sixth tribe. The Huron to the west, they are another Iroquoian language-speaking tribe that are most certainly not part of the Haudenosaunee Confederation. And when I say a linguistic group, what I mean is that these people have their own dialects, but they can pretty much understand each other without the need for an interpreter. If I am a Mohawk and I travel out to Onondaga country, the people are going to sound different. Maybe they pronounce things in different ways. They uh, may have some slang terms I'm not familiar with, but... For day-to-day -day terms and conducting a little bit of trade, well, I'm going to be just fine. Now, what's kind of mysterious is how the Iroquois-speaking peoples came to be where they live. See, these tribes in modern-day Ontario and New York are surrounded by rival Algonquian tribes who are linguistically separate. So... If the Onondaga language and the Oneida language are analogous to two different dialects of French, uh, the Iroquois languages and Algonquian languages are analogous to French and Hindi. Right? How these people came to be neighbors is a mystery that is lost to the depths of time. Now, why we even use the term Iroquois to refer to the language group is unclear. The word itself is French, properly pronounced Iroquois, but there's a lot of debate about its origins. My favorite story is that some French traders had an Algonquian guide and they encountered some Iroquois. And when the traders asked their guide who these strangers were, the Algonquian guide, who had no desire to introduce these traders to competition, uh, well, he called them little snakes. And in Algonquian, little snakes sounds a lot like Iroquois. And so the French started calling them Iroquois, and that's where we get the name. Anyway, all five of these Haudenosaunee tribes speak very similar languages, but they are also different from their Algonquian neighbors because they practice a lot of agriculture. The Algonquians do a little farming, but they rely mostly on hunting, trapping, and fishing to obtain their food. This difference is so pronounced that in later years, the Algonquian are actually reliant on the Haudenosaunee to meet their food demands. For generations... Some of the myths say, since the beginning of time, the Haudenosaunee tribes had been at war with each other. There was a never-ending blood feud with constant vendettas and bloodshed between the five tribes, and even between different clans in the same tribe. But then, the five tribes come together and form a confederacy, which is what we would today call a federative form of government. When exactly this happens is tough to say. Some sources say it happens as early as the year 1100. Others put the date of Haudenosaunee unification as late as the end of the 1500s, at the dawn of European contact. My guess is the late 1400s or early 1500s, and that's just because of some early European reports that say that the unification happened when the great-great-grandparents of the current generation were only youths, but even that's just one more unreliable source. So what can we say about the origins of the Haudenosaunee Confederacy? Well, here is what all the sources agree on. We have three main characters. First, we have Daganawida, who is also known as the Great Peacemaker. Then we have Hiawatha, who is a powerful chieftain. 
and we have Jigon Sasi, who is a wise woman. And how exactly these characters interact depends on the story. Right? In some versions, the great peacemaker is an exiled Huron chieftain who comes to unite the Haudenosaunee. In others, he is a Mohawk chief. In others still, he is sent directly by the Iroquois god, the creator, to make peace between the people. Supposedly, he does this by impressing everyone by carrying around a stone canoe. Canoes are very important to the Iroquois, since if you've lived in this area, you know how many rivers and lakes there are, and water is a major mode of transportation. And being able to carry your canoe is a useful skill, since you might have to move it around from one waterway to another, but nobody uses a stone canoe, and this impresses people very much. Now, Early on in his quest, wandering from one tribal chief to the next to convince them to make peace, early on, the great peacemaker encounters a wise woman named Jigon Sasi, and tells her of his dream of peace among the tribes. Jigansasi encourages him, and her home becomes a gathering place where warring chiefs can meet in peace and work out their differences. So, the great peacemaker goes forth on his quest from east to west, starting with the Mohawk. And this is one thing that all the stories I've seen actually agree on. And it lends credence to the version of the story that says that the great peacemaker is a Mohawk chief. Doesn't prove it, though. At some point, he encounters another chief who joins him on his journey. And this man is named Hiawatha. And just like with the great peacemaker, it is not clear who exactly Hiawatha is. In some versions of the story, he is a Mohawk chief. In others, he's an Onondaga chief, and in still others, he is an Onondaga chief who has been adopted by the Mohawk. So, regardless, he joins the great peacemaker on his quest, and the two friends make their way throughout all the Haudenosaunee lands, convincing one chief after another to abandon all blood feuds and unite in peace as one confederation or as we modern people might say, as one nation. My favorite version of this story is the Onondaga version. And yes, I'm biased because where I live is just a few minutes drive from the remaining Onondaga nation territory. But this story is pretty colorful. See, in the Onondaga story, the last opponent to peace is a chief named Taidohado. And Taidohado is an Onondaga chief, but he's also a sorcerer. And he's so twisted by dark magic that his hair has turned into snakes. And in this story, Hiawatha is another Onondaga chief. And along with the great peacemaker and the other tribes, they defeat Taidohado in a battle at Onondaga Lake. And when you read the story, it sounds like more of a spiritual battle because it's said that the great peacemaker and Hiawatha overcome Taidahato and comb the snakes from his hair. And then he agrees to make peace. And at this point, the wise woman, Jigansasi, is brought in as a mediator, and she assigns all the chiefs to their roles in the new government. And this establishes a system of government where the Haudenosaunee Confederation will be ruled by a group of male chiefs who are hand-picked by the female elders from the various tribes. Haudenosaunee literally means people of the longhouse. And it is the longhouse that most distinguishes one of their villages from the surrounding Algonquian tribes. The Algonquian tribes have smaller, more rudimentary dwellings, sometimes little more than tents with a wooden frame. The Haudenosaunee, however, 
live in wooden villages organized around a large communal hall called a longhouse because it's the longest building in the village. If you were to visit one of these longhouses in the early 1500s during a political debate, you would notice one major difference between them and a European parliament. See, in Europe, everyone debating would be a man. Or if there are any women, it would be one or two women of noble birth, uh, maybe a queen or an influential duchess. But it would be almost entirely men. And at this hypothetical Hodenosone debate, you would see a more or less equal balance, or if anything, there might even be slightly more women. See, the Hodenosone have a strong martial tradition, and powerful warriors, men, have a lot of influence and make a lot of the decisions, but in Hodenosone society, it is the women who wield all the financial power. In fact, inheritance is matrilineal, not patrilineal. So when a Hodenosone man marries a woman, he leaves his tribe and becomes a part of hers. And their children are part of her tribe and contribute to its prosperity. And make no mistake, it will be a different tribe because marrying someone from your own tribe, even from a different clan, is considered just as incestuous as marrying your own sibling. And the result of this system is a large number of influential and well-to-do matriarchs who are powerful women in their own right. And this leads to confusion when they're trying to negotiate with Europeans and the Europeans don't understand the social structure and are trying to just deal with the men. And number one, the men don't have the authority that the Europeans think they do. They also may not even have insight into their own financials in the way that their wives would. It's another cultural quirk that causes some uh, miscommunications when these people start to bump into each other. Like I said, when the first Europeans arrive in this part of North America, there aren't even very many of them. It's not until the early 1600s that the French start settling in modern-day Canada along the St. Lawrence River, and the Dutch and British settle in New York and New England. Even then, these are mostly very small settlements. The colonists are traders interested in buying furs. During this time period, the late 1500s and early 1600s, the Hodenosaunee are expanding their territory rapidly. Because the five tribes are at peace with each other, they are now free to make war against the surrounding Algonquians, and even against the Iroquois-speaking Huron tribes to the west. For a while, it looks like the Haudenosaunee Confederacy is going to be the dominant power in northeastern North America. When the French found their first permanent settlement, Quebec, in 1608, they find that the nearby Algonquian tribes at war with the Iroquois. And since the Algonquins are their first trading partners, French explorer Samuel de Champlain forms an alliance with them against the Haudenosaunee, who, if you recall, they call the Iroquois. And the French trade guns and steal tools to the Algonquins in exchange for furs. And they refuse to trade with the Haudenosaunee under any circumstances, and it starts to look like the Algonquins may get the upper hand here, because now they have guns. But a few years later, in 1615, the Dutch found a settlement, Fort Nassau, on the Hudson River, near modern-day Albany, New York. And this, like the French settlement at Quebec, is... A very small settlement, just some merchants, basically, who want to trade for furs, but other settlements soon sprout up throughout the Hudson Valley, including the colony of New Amsterdam on Manhattan Island, which will one day become New York. The Dutch take a different approach to trade, though. 
Right. They are settling their colonies among the local Lenape peoples, and they don't want to trade guns to the Lenape. Right. The Dutch settlers, not very many of them, and unlike the French, uh, who have at least a few soldiers with them, none of these early Dutch settlers are soldiers. Some very well-armed civilians, but that's just not how the Dutch do business at this time. And they fear what might happen if the Lenape are as well-armed as they are. So they trade other useful old-world things like steel tools and horses and donkeys and chickens, uh, but they aren't going to trade any guns to the Lenape. But they don't have any problem trading guns to the Odenosone, whose lands are further inland. Right? The Lenape are mostly coastal. If they become hostile to the Dutch and they have guns, the Dutch are going to have to leave North America. The Haudenosaunee are a little further inland. That's less of a concern. And so the Dutch start trading them guns. Now, this is against official Dutch policy right? and will remain so for a few decades yet. Uh, but this black market weapons trade... Uh, corrects the imbalance of technology between the Haudenosaunee and the Algonquian, uh, since both groups of tribes now have guns and steel tools. And this leads to a series of wars that lasts all the way to the early 1700s. Nowadays, they are called the Beaver Wars, because that's what Europeans called them. And from the European perspective, all of this conflict is about fur, specifically beaver fur. Right? The Dutch and French colonies are both trying to buy as much fur as possible. Furs are becoming more popular as Europe becomes more wealthy, and we're also in the middle of a period known as the Little Ice Age, where temperatures are about 3.5 degrees Fahrenheit cooler than they are now, so people are bundling up a little more. In fact, it's during this same period, uh, most of the 1600s, that the Russians are engaged in some fur-related conquests of their own. Right? Even as the Dutch and French fur trading colonies are arming local natives to engage in proxy wars, Russian armies are slowly marching east across Siberia, subjugating one local tribe after another and demanding fur tribute. Whereas the Russians are connected to these tribes by land and can send large armies after them, the French and Dutch colonists are grossly outnumbered, and they also don't want to come into direct conflict with each other. Right? Dutch and French colonists start shooting at each other. That's going to have repercussions back home in Europe. So instead, you end up with these proxy wars, with the French arming and supplying the Algonquins, and the Dutch arming and supplying the Haudenosaunee, and the Europeans call them the Bieber Wars. What gets lost here, though, is the reason that the Native Americans themselves are fighting. Yes, access to European trade is important especially when European trade means your tribe gets to make a technological leap ahead of its neighbors. But we can't forget about the Colombian exchange, can we? Because just as the people of South and Central America and the Caribbean have died in their millions, now the pain is about to come down on these North American peoples. Imagine that you're living in a Haudenosaunee village in 1608. Suddenly, a plague breaks out, a mysterious, never-before-seen illness. People are just dropping dead, and not even your most skilled herbalists have any idea what to do. The wisest elders have never seen anything like this in their lives, and they don't remember any stories like this either. This is new. And people keep dying. And within a few years, 90% of your village is gone. There used to be 200 people here. Now there are only 20 of you left. 
Think of the ten people closest to you. And now imagine that nine of them are dead. This isn't just a matter of personal grief either. Some villages lose all their chiefs and wise women at a stroke, erasing centuries of wisdom and knowledge. And from a purely practical perspective, who is left to till the fields? Who is left to patch up your buildings or take care of the few remaining children? This is a traumatic, apocalyptic experience. And odds are, when you're trying to rebuild what's left of your civilization, you're not going to spend a lot of time thinking about the European beaver trade. For many tribes, this is a time to hunker down and rebuild. And when you've lost 90% of your population, you need to make babies and not pick too many fights. At least, that's what most of the North American tribes seem to be doing. But the Haudenosaunee take a different approach. They engage in a series of expansive wars against their neighbors and end up controlling more land than ever before. And if this seems insane, rest assured that there is a method to their madness. Right? These expansive wars allow them to take captives, and these captives are then forcibly adopted into the Haudenosaunee tribes, and their children are brought up speaking Iroquoian dialects. And let's be clear, when I say adopted, I mean that most of the men are tortured to death and the fertile women are forced into marriages. By modern standards, we might even use a word like genocide to refer to this. Regardless, uh, this is why if you look at a map of Native American tribes before European contact and you look at the population today, there seems to be a disproportionate number of modern people claiming Iroquois descent. Algonquian tribes like the Mohicans had previously outnumbered them, but that's before the Beaver Wars. It's during this period that Native American tactics come to resemble the type of raiding tactics we see in popular culture, but that's not actually an expression of traditional Native American tactics. By traditional, I mean pre-European. Right? When Samuel Champlain first encounters the Iroquois in battle, they fight in formation. They're almost like ancient Greeks. They form a wall with wooden shields, and they fight from behind it with spears. But with their reduced numbers and the coming of firearms, the Haudenosaunee start fighting in smaller war bands, and Instead of seeking out large, pitched battles, they engage in constant low-level raids to exhaust their enemies. Now, that's a general rule. Uh, there are some cases where you will hear about a major raid where they take 500 or 700 captives, but those are exceptional events. And on a day-to-day -day basis, these beaver wars are a ton of low-level raiding and than the intermittent large fight. And to support this, the Haudenosaunee also build supply depots along their routes of march. And some of these depots even grow to become small forts. So you can see the Haudenosaunee becoming more sophisticated at warfare. And by modern standards, a lot of what they're doing is rudimentary, but what they're doing is they are starting to make war like a modern nation-state. And combined with being better at agriculture than their neighbors, uh, always good if you can feed your armies, uh, this gives them a huge edge. During the course of these wars, the Iroquois, I'm sorry, the Haudenosaunee, uh, conquer around the southern portion of the Great Lakes, uh, seizing modern-day Wisconsin from the Huron tribes and even conquering across modern Illinois as far as the Mississippi River. Twice during the Beaver Wars, the Haudenosaunee actually go to war directly with the French, uh, with mixed results, but 
What ultimately causes them to make peace is the loss of their Dutch allies. See, from 1664 to 1674, the Dutch lose their North American colonies and new British settlers start to move in. The province of New York is established in 1664. The colony of Pennsylvania is founded in 1681. The New England colonies of Massachusetts and Connecticut have been growing since the 1620s, so even as the Haudenosaunee are securing their neighbors' lands and holding their own against the French, they now have to worry about the growing 13 colonies. So, in 1701, the Haudenosaunee, along with 33 other tribes, sign a peace treaty with the French. In this treaty, many of the other tribes, such as the Illinois tribe and the Miami tribe of Ohio, have their lands returned to them. During the final years of the Beaver Wars, though, the Haudenosaunee have formed a new friendship, this time with the British. And with the loss of Dutch trade, they have happily begun trading with the new British colonists, who are, in turn, all too happy to trade European goods for more furs. In fact, late in the war, the Haudenosaunee have even allied with the British, who were at war with France in a separate independent war, and as part of a separate 1701 treaty, the Haudenosaunee hand over most of the land they conquered north of the Ohio River to the British crown. This land will later become subject to disputes by several of the 13 colonies who want to expand into that area. And a colonial desire to push westward becomes a bone of contention between the colonists and the British crown. Even if that push westward might mean pushing out the Haudenosaunee. During the last portion of the 1600s, the Haudenosaunee undergo a technological revolution. Prior to European contact, these were Stone Age people. I don't mean that in a derogatory sense, I mean it in the literal sense of the term. These people were not hunter-gatherers, they have sophisticated agriculture and permanent settlements, but they had not developed metalworking yet, so they were quite literally using stone tools. Now, during the late 16 and early 1700s, the Haudenosaunee aren't just trading furs in exchange for European tools. They've figured out how to work metal, how to smelt it and mold it and smith it, and now they're actually making tools of their own. Let's be clear about the type of technological revolution we're talking about for these people. A couple of generations ago, they were in the Stone Age. And now they're producing medieval-era technology and they have access to modern weaponry. That is a head-spinning rate of change. And along with this technological change, the Haudenosaunee are also beginning to adopt European religion. Anglican missionaries from the British and Catholic Jesuit missionaries from the French try to convert the tribes with varying levels of success. And Christianity becomes commonplace alongside the old tribal beliefs. And if I'm not mistaken, to this day, Catholicism is the majority religion among Mohawks. Following the end of the Beaver Wars, there is a period of relative peace. And in 1754, the Haudenosaunee joined the British in a war against the French and their Native American allies. This is a conflict that comes to be known in North America as the French and Indian War. Eventually becomes a part of the global conflict we know as the Seven Years' War. And during this fight, the Haudenosaunee are invaluable to the British. And when the British are victorious, it seems as if both sides have chosen the right allies. And in gratitude for the Haudenosaunee assistance in this war, King George III issues the Proclamation of 1763, 
and this outlines the western boundaries of the 13 colonies. And the boundary leaves the Haudenosaunee lands strictly off limits to British colonists. But while the Crown might have warm feelings towards their Iroquoian allies, many of the colonists feel differently. They want to settle further inland, and the Haudenosaunee are in the way. This leads to friction on the colonial frontier, especially when colonists clear land and build farms on Haudenosaunee land. All of this to say that there is a powder keg primed to explode should the British colonists ever stop listening to their king. Foreshadowing. When the U.S. War of Independence breaks out, the Haudenosaunee are at a crossroads. On the one hand, they have long been allies with the British, and the Crown, in return, has mostly kept their colonists from encroaching on Haudenosaunee land. King George is a good friend. On the other hand, King George is an ocean away. If the colonials succeed in breaking free, wouldn't it be better for the Haudenosaunee if they had fought on the winning side? The the Haudenosaunee Confederacy itself remains officially neutral throughout the war. However, the Oneidas and the Tuscaroras officially side with the revolutionaries. They're not allowed to make war against other tribes in the Confederacy, but they can go make war against the Redcoats, can't they? In the meantime... Large numbers of men in the other tribes, uh, which are not officially at war with anybody, but you know, large numbers of men in those tribes, uh, they fight on the British side. Uh, in particular, there are a lot of Mohawks uh, fighting with the British and the Loyalist militias. And as a result of warriors from different tribes in the Confederacy fighting on different sides, the Haudenosaunee see something they haven't seen since the time of the Great Peacemaker. They see Haudenosaunee warriors sometimes fighting against other Haudenosaunee warriors. In July of 1778, things escalate. A group of British loyalists under the command of Colonel John Butler joins with a group of Mohawk and Seneca warriors and ambushes a colonial supply depot near Wilkes-Barre, Pennsylvania. In reprisal, in September of 1778, a force of colonial troops burns a number of Seneca villages. In November, matters come to a head. Colonel Butler and his loyalists, along with their Mohawk and Seneca allies, attack a small colonial fort at Cherry Valley, New York. Ultimately, they are unable to force the fort to surrender, but a number of people in the surrounding town are caught outside. In a town of less than 200 inhabitants, 30 are killed, and many of those are raped or scalped. An additional 30 citizens, mostly women, are taken captive. In response, George Washington decides to kneecap the Haudenosaunee. He's going to destroy their agricultural base and make it impossible for them to continue to be a threat. On May 31, 1779, he sends the following order to General John Sullivan. Quote, the expedition you were appointed to command is to be directed against the hostile tribes of the Six Nations of Indians, with their associates and adherents. The immediate objects are the total destruction and devastation of their settlements, and the capture of as many prisoners of every age and sex as possible. It will be essential to ruin their crops now in the ground, and prevent their planting more. I would recommend that some post in the center of the Indian country should be occupied with all expedition with a sufficient quantity of provisions whence parties should be detached to lay waste all the settlements around, with instructions to do it in the most effectual manner, that the country may not be merely overrun, but destroyed. 
but you will not by any means listen to any overture of peace before the total ruinment of their settlements is effected. Our future security will be in their inability to injure us and in the terror with which the severity of the chastisement they receive will inspire them. Unquote. What follows becomes known as the Sullivan Campaign. Over the course of the summer of 1779, General Sullivan's 4,000 troops lay waste to dozens of Haudenosaunee settlements. They spare the allied Oneida and Ticonderoga tribes, but the rest see their villages and crops burned. In the winter of 1779 to 1780, after the raid's conclusion, thousands of Haudenosaunee people die of starvation and exposure. And remember, with the exception of some clans and individuals in the Mohawk and Seneca tribes, the rest of these tribes are officially neutral. There might be some individual warriors off fighting in the war on one side or the other, but the tribes themselves are at peace. These villages aren't even expecting an attack. They haven't been taking measures to defend themselves, and against a bunch of well-organized, angry attackers, they stand little chance. There is continued fighting in Haudenosaunee lands throughout the rest of the war, but following the Sullivan campaign, the tribes simply don't have the economic or agricultural base to support major armies. You can still see the effects of the Sullivan campaign and the U.S. War for Independence today. If you look at sources from the Oneida tribe, for example you'll see a lot of emphasis on their help for the American colonists. For example, Chief Shenandoah shipped corn to George Washington's troops at Valley Forge, saving his army from starvation. Some Oneida will even claim the mantle of America's first ally, and if you view them as a nation in the modern sense, they would indeed be the first American ally, even beating out the French. On the other hand... What about those tribes who were neutral and who were attacked? Well, if you go to the official website of the Onondaga Nation, there is an entire page about how they called George Washington Hanandaga Yas, which means the town destroyer. And even today, they refer to the U.S. president as Hanadaga Yas. So, even among the six Haudenosaunee tribes, you have different views on their relationship to the young new United States. But following the U.S. War for Independence, things do not go well for any of the Haudenosaunee tribes. Many Americans, particularly those in New York and Pennsylvania, want the Haudenosaunee lands for themselves. And... In the 1783 Treaty of Paris that ends the war, the Haudenosaunee are not even mentioned. When tribal chiefs ask the new American government whether they intend to abide by the proclamation of 1763 and its official western boundary, they're met with silence. Soon thereafter, that silence is replaced by a series of lowball land purchase offers backed up with the threat of violence. By 1796, most remaining Haudenosaunee lands have been absorbed by the state of New York. Now, despite being part of the U.S., most of these lands remain in Haudenosaunee hands. In other words, they may have become part of New York, but the actual people living there are still Haudenosaunee, but the federal government needs land for Revolutionary War veterans, and they decide that this area in New York State would be a good place for some of those people to live, and New York Governor George Clinton pressures individual natives to sell. One by one, many of them do, and one thing that uh, Governor Clinton does uh, is he actually gives alcohol to a lot of these people. He gets the Haudenosaunee people addicted. 
and those individuals who become alcoholics are no longer able to maintain their lands and they are forced to sell. And by the 1820s, most of the Haudenosaunee are simply gone. They have sold their land and moved west. And there are only a few small reservations remaining. And land confiscations would continue until as late as the 1950s. Reservation land has been seized under eminent domain for all kinds of public projects, from roads to bridges to dams. And in the aftermath of World War II, the U.S. federal government tries to inflict another insult on the Haudenosaunee tribes, American citizenship. See, traditionally, members of recognized tribes have not been considered citizens. This means they don't get to vote, but they also don't have to pay federal taxes, and as long as they're on the reservation, they're exempt from state laws. And a series of laws in the middle 20th century, called the Indian Termination Laws, aims to change that. Dozens of tribes throughout the U.S. are effectively destroyed by this legislation. But the Haudenosaunee tribes band together to oppose the law that would disband the New York tribes. And the bill is ultimately defeated, so to this day, the Onondaga Nation and others are still considered sovereign Indian nations. This brings up an interesting question, though, doesn't it? What does sovereignty actually mean when you only hold a few square miles of land? To be fair, it means some measure of freedom. For example, the members of recognized tribes are exempt from state hunting and fishing license requirements. There's an acknowledgement that this is their ancestral land, and they have the right to exploit the natural resources in a way that doesn't apply to anyone whose ancestors came from the old world. On the other hand, none of the Haudenosaunee tribes are recognized by the United Nations, and except in a few limited cases, nobody recognizes their passports. If you're a member of the Onondaga Nation and you want to fly to the UK, your Onondaga Nation passport is no good. You've got to get a U.S. passport. The peoples of these six Haudenosaunee nations exist in a kind of limbo. They're not totally American unless they want to be. But their nations are still fighting for the same kind of respect that other nations take for granted. The tough part about this story is that it's still ongoing. Yes, all of history is ongoing in the broad sense, but what I mean is that the question of Haudenosaunee nationalism or the nationalism of any individual tribe is not a settled issue. Even today, there are members of these tribes who are working to obtain international recognition, and while I can't speak for Canada, the U.S. court systems have gradually shifted in their favor. Nobody in the U.S. government is seriously suggesting formal recognition of the Haudenosaunee Confederacy as a full-fledged nation. It's not even clear how that would work. Certainly, the state of New York is not about to give most of its land over to a tribal council, and nowhere in the world is there any example I can think of of shared sovereignty over the same land between two full-fledged nations. The other challenge ending this story is that I don't want to get political. Actually, not getting political is one of the unwritten rules for this show. But at the same time, I don't want to just leave things hanging. And national identity is about a lot more than just lines on a map or formal recognition by the UN. It's about culture and language and a sense of belonging in a community. So, how are the Haudenosaunee people doing in that regard? Well, I'm not qualified to answer that question myself, so let's turn to someone who can. In his book, Who Are These People Anyway?, Chief Irving Paulus Jr. of the Beaver Clan of the Onondaga Nation tells us about the traditional game of lacrosse. 
This is a spiritual game for the Haudenosaunee, but it's changed since European contact. And Paulus is writing this back in 2010. Anyway, this is a long quote. Couldn't find a good way to trim it down without it losing some of its meaning. But I'll let Chief Paulus tell the story. He writes, quote, Now, to show you another difference between our people and yours, let's go back to what I was saying about how we play our games for our enjoyment. And let's talk a little about lacrosse. Today we're going to talk about Dehunshigua S, which means they bump hips. This is a game that the creator gave us years ago for his entertainment. So when we play this game, we are entertaining him. And the game is made up of his rules and regulations so that we learn how to work together as a team to make split-second decisions on what is happening. And it gives us a chance to display our gifts that the Creator has given us, like the ability to run and to handle a stick. This game is known by us as Dehunt Shigua S, but over the years, because of the French and the Europeans coming into our country and watching us play, they now call the game lacrosse. Lacrosse at Onondaga is considered sacred. It is a game to be played for the Creator and has been known to have healing power. The game in its original form is played between two groups, usually either divided up by clans or by age, young men versus old men. Since women are respected for providing life and are to protect this gift, they do not play lacrosse. Once sides are chosen, the two teams play. The men hold in their hands handmade sticks, usually made of hickory. The spirit of the tree connects the player to Mother Earth while they play for the Creator. The game is played on an open field, with two poles at each end, signifying goals, which a ball made of leather must pass through. As our white brothers began to play, the growth of our game allowed our people to play lacrosse in many different arenas. Soon, the Onondagas were playing field lacrosse with the local colleges and universities in the area. It was very common for Onondaga to play Syracuse University, Colgate University, and the Army in the early 1900s. Then, in 1932, the Olympics wanted to showcase lacrosse in the upcoming games in Los Angeles. The Onondaga Nation team was very polished and was undefeated in the area. A playoff was established, and it was a match between the Onondagas and a team from Johns Hopkins to play each other to represent the games at the Olympics. Johns Hopkins prevailed, but both teams respected each other's play. These days, it's played by high schools, colleges, and professional teams throughout the world. I was five years old when I received my first stick, made out of hickory with a rawhide netting on which to catch and carry the ball. My father gave it to me and then we went out into the front yard and we played catch with a rubber ball. Old lacrosse was played with a ball made out of leather, and the type that my father and I were playing with is made out of India rubber. It's hard. It bounces very well off the fields. And later, when we played box lacrosse, it bounced well off the wooden floors and concrete floors that we played on. So anyway, at the age of five, I received my first stick. At the age of nine, I received my second stick, which was made out of white ash. And I have played in the old way, in a field with two sticks stuck in the ground as the goal, and I wore no pads. The stick that I got in 1939 lasted me until 1949. Ten years I played with it. That stick lasted me until I was 19 years old. When I was 17 and 18, I played field lacrosse against the colleges around the area like Hobart, Cortland, Colgate, Cornell, and Syracuse University. So by the time I was 19 years old, I had been playing on the men's team for two years. And my next stick lasted me until 1971. And other people who played, when I wasn't playing, would come and borrow my stick, because it was so good. It was a very light stick, and very accurate. You could put the ball where you wanted to with it. So lacrosse players would come to my house and borrow my stick. I said, well, you can borrow it, but don't break it. And fortunately for me, they kept coming back. But after years of use, that stick finally wore out and I had to get a new one. So in 1971, I bought a new stick, which I still have. 
Unfortunately, with the success of the Onondaga teams against the collegiate teams, the National Association, U.S. Lacrosse, banned all native teams from playing field lacrosse because they felt that the natives were professional players. Since the Onondagas and the rest of the Haudenosaunee couldn't play field lacrosse, they turned their attention northward, where the Canadians were starting a new kind of lacrosse. The Canadians began playing lacrosse inside empty hockey rinks. The Onondagas and the Haudenosaunee quickly took to the physical nature of the game, where intricate stick skills were fostered in box lacrosse. Soon, box lacrosse leagues became commonplace in the communities of the Haudenosaunee. From that point on, players became so adept at the box game that players such as Lyle Pierce and Stanley Pierce, and my father, Irving Paulus Sr., were inducted into the National Lacrosse Hall of Fame for their prowess on the field. So by the time I was 19, we had formed a box lacrosse league. And from 1949 to 1971, a period of 22 years, I played box lacrosse. Field and box lacrosse are totally different games. When the Europeans started playing the game, well, we played on an open field with two sticks stuck into the ground as goalposts, and the ball had to go between the two posts. And we had limits on how many scores would be made before one would be declared the winner, so that the games didn't last forever. If you made three goals, you were the winner. Therefore, the game was not timed. And when the Europeans started playing the game, they changed the game completely. In the old way, everybody who showed up at our games was able to play. I've played in games where we had teenagers and 80-year-old men playing on the same team, with an unlimited number of players on each team. We had the goalposts, but there were no sidelines, so you could run anywhere. And you could run anywhere between the goalposts. But the Europeans changed the rules. They put in a center line, and they put limits on the numbers. They put ten players on a field lacrosse team and five players on a box lacrosse team. In box lacrosse, half the team only played on one half of the court. And field lacrosse was the same way, so it restricted the play. I played box lacrosse for 22 years, and for 21 of those years I played without a helmet. And in the 22nd year, we started playing against Europeans who had different rules, regulations, and methods of play. The way we play, we play with no pads, no helmet, no face guards, no gloves, and we play only with wooden sticks. With the invention of plastic, today you have plastic sticks and big rule changes. So when I started playing box lacrosse against the Europeans, I had to wear a helmet to protect myself. But we played to entertain the creator, so nobody got hurt. We tried to hit the sticks, to knock the ball out of the stick, and we bumped hips to knock the opponent down so he would not be able to score. That's why the game is called They Bump Hips. This bumping of hips is a technique all by itself. My dad started playing lacrosse when he was 15 years old. He was playing field lacrosse. Later, he played professional lacrosse, box lacrosse, for Syracuse and Rochester. And when I was learning to play, he said, when we played, we bumped hips and this is how we did it. And so I listened to him very carefully, and I said, I'm going to try this out. So one day when we were playing, a guy came running by. I watched, and the words from my father came into my head. And I watched this man coming at me, and I watched his feet. Now the timing has to be just right in order to do this. So when the timing was right, I moved and bumped his hip. And down he went. And I said, wow, it really works. And so I kept doing this. And the more I did it, the better I got at it. After not too long, I was pretty proficient at it. And I became known as this kind of player that would bump into you and knock you down. And I knocked down a lot of people. Playing field lacrosse, I came up against all Americans who had never played in a game where the old way was played. But these all Americans were six foot and they weighed 200 pounds. I was a strapping 144 pounds. But by playing for 22 years, I was strong. And so when these big guys came running at me, I had no fear about bumping into them. And of course, they didn't expect to be bumped. So when they got knocked down, they were really surprised. One of the persons that I knocked down was named Bill Fuller, three-time All-American center for Syracuse University and the leading scorer on the team. At halftime, he was scoreless. I had knocked him down three times as he tried to make it in toward the net to score a goal. 
and Roy Simmons Sr., their lacrosse coach, was really mad at what I was doing. So he instructed his team to get me. He said, I want that man taken out. And now I'm up there. I've got ten players trying to nail me. And they finally got their chance. I was standing near the center line, and I hollered for a pass. Howie Hill threw me one of those looping passes, and it stayed up in the air for a while. So the defenseman could see where the ball was going, and I was just standing there. The two defensemen came rushing at me. As one hit me from the front, the other one hit me from the back. Fortunately for me, they met at the same time, so they canceled out the checks. There was a loud crash as the three of us banged into each other, and of course all three of us went down. But I wasn't hurt. If I'd just been hit by one of them, I would have gone flying one way. But because I got hit the same time from front and back, I didn't go anywhere. The referee came over and he blew his whistle, and he penalized both defensemen for unnecessary roughness. He gave them each a minute penalty. And then I stood up, and he said, Are you all right? And I said, Yeah, I'm all right. I said, Give me the ball. He said, What? I said, Give me the ball so we can continue playing. He said, After that hit, you're going to play? I said, Well, yeah, I'm all right. It's only one body check, so I'm used to that. Give me the ball. So he put the ball in my stick and blew the whistle. I was playing midfield, but I threw the ball over to Ed Shenandoah, another midi, and then I went for the goal, and I hollered for a pass. He passed the ball back to me, and I took a couple of steps and wound up, and I shot for the net, and I scored a goal. This, of course, infuriated the SU coach, Roy Simmons. I told you to get that guy. He's knocking down our players, and now he's scoring on us. And I just laughed. And we went off the field and faced off again, and we played. So for the rest of the game, I had the whole team chasing me. We lost the game because we didn't have any substitutes, and they had probably about 40 or 50 players out there. So they just ran us to the ground. But we had fun. We enjoyed ourselves, and it didn't matter that we lost. It was the idea that we had played. We had entertained the creator by playing his game. That's what we were supposed to do, and that's what we did. And when we played box lacrosse, I was doing the same thing. I used the same technique to knock down the big guys in box lacrosse. And then I went into the service, and I was in the Korean War. When the Korean War ended, I was over in the Mediterranean, and they immediately sent us back to the United States. So we got back to Norfolk, and they discharged me there in August of 1954. I came back home and I got engaged to be married very quickly, like in December of 54. And I was married in March of 55. And in 1955, I was back to playing box lacrosse again. One day we invited the Mohawks down to play with us. And at the last minute, they called up and said, we're not coming. And so we asked Syracuse University to bring their team down to play. They said, field lacrosse? We said, no, we play box lacrosse. And they said, all right, we'll try it out. So this was 1957. And by this time, I had put on weight. I weighed 155 pounds. I had gained over 10 pounds since I was playing earlier at 144 pounds. But I still had all the moves and all the knowledge. And so our team was out there playing. And the ball went into the corner and they blew the whistle, which gave us time to change strings. Our string came out, so I went out on the court with them. At the same time that I went out on the court, Syracuse changed their string. And Jim Brown, the famous football player, ran out on the field. And there was a big fight for the ball over in the east corner of the box. Well, he went into that fight for the ball, scooped up the ball, and came out with the ball and headed west towards his goal, the goal he was supposed to score in. As he started downfield, I was the only one standing between him and the goal. And he took one look at me and said to himself, Well, I'll go right by this guy. So he came pounding up at top speed at 235 pounds. And as he went by me, I bumped his hip. And down he went. It was the first time he'd ever been knocked down in a lacrosse game, any lacrosse game. He played high school, he played college, and he'd never been knocked down. He was in our box lacrosse game 30 seconds and he was lying on his back. I guess he found it unbelievable. After the game, 
I got a chance to meet him. Oren Lyons was on the same team as he was, and Jim Brown said to Oren, he said, Introduce me to that mosquito that knocked me down. So Oren brought him over to me, and I only came up to his chest. I had a 24-inch waist. Jim Brown had 24-inch thighs. But the technique that I had learned from my father enabled me to bump hips against Jim Brown, and down he went. This was quite an event, because I know for about 10 years after that game, they were still talking about it when lacrosse players got together down in the Syracuse area. But here's something that was more surprising. Just last year, the Iroquois national lacrosse team was going over to England to play in the World Games, and the United States and England decided that they would not accept our passports. They said, in order for us to go to England, we had to have either U.S. or Canadian passports. And we said, no, there's no way we're going to go over there as citizens of another country. We're coming over as Haudenosaunee with our own passports or we're not coming. They said, well, you can't come over unless you've got a U.S. passport or Canadian. We said, well, we're not coming. And we didn't go. So Sports Illustrated put an article in their magazine about that incident where we were denied going to play at the World Games over in England. But in the article, down at the bottom of one of the pages, it says, At a game in 1957, an Onondaga who later became one of the chiefs of the Onondaga Nation, who weighed 155 pounds, ran up against Jim Brown, who weighed 235 pounds, and knocked him down. Now, this is 57 years after the incident, and it's still being news. And here it was in Sports Illustrated, which is quite a thing for me. You know, to still be talked about after all of those years. 57 years later, we're still talking about that. I played from the time I was 17 until I was 41. And during that time, I have no idea how many goals I scored. I don't know how many games I played in. We never kept track of this stuff. We just played and had fun. And now the Onondagas excel in both the field and the box game. For example, Oren Lyons, Syracuse University All-American goaltender, is in the National Lacrosse Hall of Fame. He and Travis Cook, Russ George, Eli Cornelius, Louis Jacques, and my son Barry have been recognized on both sides of the border in various halls of fame. Current stars of both the professional field and box games are Marshall Abrams, SU All-American, Giwa Schindler, Loyola All-American, and another one of my sons, Neil Paulus, Nazareth All-American. And there are many more great players on the horizon. Unfortunately today, the colleges that play lacrosse don't play with the same connection with the creator. So they play lacrosse totally different now than how it's supposed to be played. And so the game has changed a whole lot since the time when my grandfather and my father played and since the games that I played at Onondaga, where we played only with wooden sticks. We didn't allow the newly made plastic sticks in the game, and we played according to our old rules. We didn't wear gloves. We didn't wear any pads. We didn't wear any helmets or face guards. And nobody got hurt during those games. The way they play now... It's dangerous to get into one of those games because they use their sticks, the plastic sticks, to supposedly hit the stick of the opponent. But they miss a lot of times and they hit the player. Therefore, the player has got rib pads on. He's got shoulder pads on. And he's got arm pads on to protect himself. And a helmet. And a face guard. I never had those things. I played box lacrosse for 21 years without a helmet. I never put a helmet on until the last year I played, when I was 41 years old. And that year, I got hit in a body check in Fort Erie, Canada on a concrete floor. When I landed on my shoulders, my head snapped back and I can hear my helmet click on the concrete. And I said, oh, I can see why I've got to wear a helmet. I said, because if I didn't, I'd have a headache right now. I don't know how big a bump I would have gotten, but I did hear that click when my helmet hit the concrete floor. And so I taught my boys the same, to play the game that way. One weekend, my son Brad played up north with the Mohawks. When he came back, he brought his helmet back with him, and he showed his mother his helmet, and the helmet was smashed. And he said, This is what the Mohawks did to me. He said, I was running along the boards, and they came up and they cross-checked me, and they cross-checked me in the head, and they put my head up against the boards and smashed my helmet. And how about you? Oh, he said, 
I'm all right. My helmet got smashed, that's all. So nothing much stopped them in those days, and they became all Americans. They have records that still stand in college and high school to this day. One of them is from 1975. Another one is from 1995. Their records are still standing. Anyway, it's not necessary to know who's winning or who's losing. It's to play the game to enjoy the game, because you're entertaining the creator. And that's the difference in the games. Totally different games between what we played and what they're playing now. So when we play lacrosse here on Mother Earth, there's a game going on in the creator's territory at the same time. And the ones who play lacrosse here, in the afterlife, they're going to go there and continue to play. Now, we know this to be true because in the 1800s, our ancestor, a Seneca leader named Handsome Lake, was given a message by his three messengers from the creator's land. These messengers, they took him to the Creator's land, and while he was there, he watched a lacrosse game, and he played lacrosse himself. And he watched a ceremony being conducted, and he watched singers who were singing songs to the Creator, songs that were given to us by the Creator. And then he came back home. And when he was back on Mother Earth, he was explaining to everybody what he had seen. He was telling them, that the lacrosse players today will be able to play in the future up in the Creator's Land after they've passed away. And one of the fellows that he was telling is one of the fellows that he had seen playing lacrosse up in the Creator's Land. He happened to be talking to a man who he had seen in that other land. So he stopped talking, realizing, you know, that he was telling this man that he was going to pass away. So he was talking to this guy, and three days later the man did pass away. And Handsome Lake said, Well, I know where he is. He's playing lacrosse up in the Creator's land. So today we get buried with our sticks. We have ceremonies with our ancestors. And when we have these ceremonies, there are ribbons given out. The ribbons from each ceremony then go on to the lacrosse stick. And so when we play lacrosse, that ensures that the ancestors are playing with us because of the ceremonies that we had. And this is when scores don't matter. You play to entertain the creator, and you play to enjoy the game. So our sticks are decorated with ribbons from this ceremony that we do when we dance with our elders. And the morning ribbons are given out. So I take, and I decorate my lacrosse stick with those, so that the dance we've done with our ancestors is now part of my stick. And I'll use that stick to play with my ancestors in the future. So, lacrosse is a very important game here at Onondaga. I was still playing at the age of 71 in 2001. And on the team that day, there were teenagers. And I was not the oldest one who was playing. Sandy Buck was playing, and he must have been around 83 or 84 years old. But we played the old way, with wooden sticks, with no pads, no helmet. And we had a really good time. Dehun Shigua S., is a game given to us by the Creator to entertain Him and to show our gifts, our ability to run, make split-second decisions, our ability to handle a stick, to pass, catch, and so forth. But the Creator also gave it to us to teach us how to work together as a team, to put our minds together as one. So we play the game to entertain the Creator, and we play so that we can play tomorrow if necessary, so nobody gets hurt. No one. But since we're playing according to European rules and regulation, it's not happening anymore. And unfortunately, our young people are not talking to the real old people. They're not around. So they can't explain to them how the games are supposed to be played. And so the game is not played that way today. And they not only play lacrosse in ways that cause injuries, but they'll play other games that way. They play basketball. They play football. And if there's someone good on the team, they try to wipe him out. I was reading in today's paper that Brett Favre, quarterback for the Vikings, was taken out. He got carried off the field with a head injury, and he probably won't be able to play anymore this season. He's got two more games to play, and he probably won't play them. So it ended his season. Anyway, that's the game that is called, in our language, They Bump Hips. But in the English language, as it's used today, it's called lacrosse. And it's been played here at Onondaga for thousands of years. I don't know when the game was given to us, but down through the years, it's come through. 
so I thought that maybe you would be interested in what it used to be and what it is today. There's a big difference between the two. Unquote. That may strike some people as an odd way to wrap up an episode, but a people's leisure, their religion, and their culture don't often come together the way they do for the Haudenosaunee in the game we call lacrosse. And just as the game has been forever changed by European influence, the game has also changed the Europeans. When I was at Notre Dame, the athletes with the biggest reputation for toughness were the lacrosse players. I don't know if they still do this, but the team used to actually brand a pair of lacrosse sticks onto their upper arm during their initiation ceremony. But I digress, because I understand lacrosse as a metaphor for the Haudenosaunee people of today. When you drive through the Onondaga Nation, you don't see a bunch of people in traditional clothes living off the land. You see people in blue jeans and flannel shirts working on construction crews or selling tax-free cigarettes to non-native people. In many ways, they have become Europeanized, and how could they not be? Yet at the same time, there is still a sense of nationhood to the various Honosoni tribes, a sense that these are the people who were here first, and that they still have some kind of claim to the land. The Onondaga Nation and the other peoples of the Haudenosaunee Confederacy might be American citizens. They might speak English and only use their original languages for religious ceremonies. They may live in two-story colonials instead of longhouses, and lacrosse may have crossed over from being a religious celebration to a competitive sport. But among these people there remains a strong sense of nationalism, one that may someday gain legitimacy in the world's eyes. And that's why it's relevant. Guess who? It's me again, Dan, and I'm here just to tell you about a few things we're doing to expand the channel here at Relevant History. The first thing that we're doing is a series called Dan's War College. This is a series of exclusive videos from yours truly detailing various military battles and tactics in history and breaking down how they worked in a little more detail than we do here on the main show. If you're interested in that, it is a Patreon exclusive. The link for the Relevant History Patreon is in the description, and the monthly fee for the subscription is $5. By the way, with that, you also get access to a private Discord chat room with yours truly. And yes, I take requests for those Patreon videos. Of course, not everybody is able to or wants to contribute financially, and that's just fine. I'm glad you're listening. But if you enjoy the show, why not share it with a friend? Help grow the audience and share something you love with somebody who might enjoy it. Also, it never hurts to leave a review. People are more likely to listen if they see a show with a bunch of reviews, particularly good ones, but eh, if you hated the show, go ahead and leave a review saying that, too. Tell me why you didn't like it. Alternatively, you could just reach out to me on Twitter at Dan Toller Podcast or on Facebook at facebook.com slash Dan Toller Podcast. That's Dan T-O-L-E-R Podcast. You can also reach me at dantollerpodcast at gmail.com if you think that I've made an error in one of the episodes or you just wanted to say hello. Finally, to find all of my episodes with links to all the various subscription services and podcast feeds as 
well as my blog, which I have not updated in ages, but eh, you never know. You can find all of that at dantollerpodcast.com. That's dan, T-O-L-E-R, podcast.com. Thanks for listening.